Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Really excited. Uh, you know, the more and more I've learned about what you've done with SmartBug, uh, the more excited I am to learn more. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. The legend grows. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so I figured one place maybe we could just launch off is tell me about your friend who had this fateful business trip where he ended up missing a birthday party. Oh, yeah. You know, um, so at the time, right before uh, we decided to launch SmartBug, I was working at this network security company and we won an award for a client. And the client was in San Jose, right? And I mean, those types of things, you, you give the client a call, everybody's happy and you know you send an award later. But our CEO insisted that we go visit them to give them this good news. And it was a maybe a 10 minute meeting. And so a friend of mine went up to, to do the awards and he had to miss his nephew's birthday party. And it was an experience like that where I realized that, and I had already decided I wanted to go start SmartBug at that time, but I realized that you have, at the time, this was 10 years ago before Remote was sexy, like you had, you had two options, right? You could either be as the CEO of a company, you could be the person who never went to the office and you were that guy. And that's not really a good leadership type thing. Um, or you could be the person who stayed at the office all day long and never saw your family. And that's the kind of guy you regret when you're, 90 years old and deciding what's going to happen with the couple, last couple minutes of your life. So it, it was just one of those things that stuck in the back of my head. And as you're kicking around business models, I was just like, that's it. Like there's just, there's got to be a better way where we can do both. And that really kind of inspired us to figure out how, you know, back when everybody insisted the only way to collaborate was to sit in a room with somebody and hug it out that, um, that there was a different way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems like when you frame it that way, it seems like a terrible trade off. So, I mean, 10 years ago was a long time for a remote world. So what was some of the feedback that you got from people maybe who were questioning that decision? Well, ironically, you know, if you talk to if you talk to lifelong creatives or you talk, you know, I've got some kind of friends, advisors that are you know, either from bigger agencies or did that or kind of did the big branding agency thing. They will, you know, they will tell you that, you know, creative creativity can only happen in the same room and you've got to be on this whiteboard with somebody and you've got to look them in the face. And and so I think the pushback was not so much from a client's perspective, and I'll get to that in a second, but more so like how can two people share an idea together uh, without sitting in the same room? And we figured that if we could figure out how to do that and we could figure out how to communicate without sitting in the same room with each other, that we would have better quality, that we would communicate better so our client communication would be better, that all of the stuff that agencies are notorious for dropping the ball on in terms of process and intention to detail and handoffs between teams and scheduling and things like that, that we would be much better at it. And ironically, if you ask a client, they don't really want you to come to the office. Like they see this hour meeting turn into a four hour you know, half hour chat before hour meeting that lasts too long, got to go get lunch, got to stop by and see everybody. They just want to they want to win and they want to get results and they want to partner with somebody. But they've got an hour because they want to see their family, too, and they don't want to have to drag everything out. So the pushback was really just from people who I think have never done anything differently. Um, and, uh, you know, we've kind of solved a lot of that stuff, but clients love it. Yeah, that absolutely. And I mean, it's you're right. It's one of those things where you end up doing a lot of small talk, you end up wasting a lot of time with these in-person meetings. On the flip side, I know that when we've actually spent time with clients after maybe working remote for a long time, the time is really, really enriched and like people are taking mm -hmm. advantage of it together, too. That's cool. So yeah, when you can do that, I think I think if you like do some. Um you know, depending on the client, right, especially if there's multiple constituents, a site visit to kick off something is great because you do build you do build a connection with somebody that you don't get remote the whole time. But I think if you add like some, you know, kind of interesting culture flavor to your company, then they kind of um, they kind of look at you as an inspiration in a way for kind of what your team's doing lately. And and so that I think there's trade offs for both. But I think um, I think the remote thing works pretty well. For sure. Yeah. So is a site visit a regular part of kind of your client engagement or is that just kind of depend on the client? Depends. Um, so we have a, a, a really fantastic client that's in the human capital space. And um, that's the kind of client you have to go see. Right. Because like they're they're creating culture like as a that's what they do for large companies. And so to go see what their culture looks like and how they interact with people and they do these really kind of hands on 
um, like immersive experiential training type things to build um, camaraderie and team and, and stuff like that. And so to go actually on site to see them is really, really useful. Um, to go on site to see other types of companies that maybe not, you know, a senior care company is another one that it's good to go see because you get a flavor for individual communities. But for some companies like software companies and things like that, it's not necessary. And we'll do it if a client wants us to. But nine times out of 10, they just want to um, they just want to grow their business and generate more revenue. Totally. Yeah, it makes total sense on the client side. I guess one of the things that you alluded to was being able to stay creative and stay collaborative in a remote model. I think a lot of people who never have known anything different might be wondering, just even practically, how do you how do you do that? How do you allow for spontaneity and innovation, you know, across multiple states? Sure. So, I think the big thing is uh, people who are concerned about that assume that a remote company is this, you know, this classic example of a guy or a girl sitting in the corner with this dark room with this light shining on their computer and they're just typing on headphones and podcasts are the only time I wear headphones. But, um, and that's just not true. Like we spend so much time on video and so much time on zoom instant messaging and things like that. And so a, a lot of the, the creativity comes from the fact that we have this culture where People know that they have an intellectual, they have this deep intellectual respect for people that they work with. And they know that if they come to work every day, that they're going to work with people that are really smart. And so we have this culture that that people aren't afraid to ask for help or ask for ideas or ask for questions. And so you can have creativity on a certain project where you're trying to solve a particular problem. But at the same time, if you trust everybody that has a really strong knowledge set to answer a question or give you an idea or give you kind of a nudge in a direction that they might have seen before, you can capture that creative thinking kind of on a regular, spontaneous basis without having a formal sit down structured meeting. And I think that's probably the most powerful part of what I think that we've built is that um, from a small idea to a larger campaign, we have we can tap into the 50 or 60 people that we have here. Um, that are able to answer those questions from their unique perspective. And I think it allows us to move a lot faster and, and kind of crowdsource some really interesting stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that seems like it's really, really important for this model is just the methods of communications, maybe the tools of communication yeah. too. And I'm sure those have changed and evolved over the years. What do you use now for communication as a team and how did that maybe evolve from the early days? Sure. So uh, we use we use Zoom mostly in the Google Suite. Um, regardless of which tool you use, whether you use you know Zoom, some video tool you need, I think, because the nonverbal communication is is important. You know, if you're in an office, it's really easy to walk by a desk and see that somebody's having a tough day um, and grab them for a cup of coffee and and see what's bothering them. If you're in a remote model, you don't necessarily have the ability to do that. And so you try to pick up on cues based on nonverbal communication that you see on video. So we kind of have like a video required policy here, um, except, you know, if people are like sick or something like that. Um, but we do that because that's the closest thing that we can get from people to people interaction. So a video tool is great. We've found Zoom is probably the best uh, for us. We use um, Google, you know, G Suite for all of our kind of written communications and storage and stuff like that. Um, we have, there's kind of a debate here about Slack versus zoom and all that stuff for instant messaging. We use Slack with some external partners cause they use it, but we've tried to use zoom for all of our instant messaging cause it's all on one platform. Um, that's kind of all you need. You know, we use a, a project management system named teamwork because, um, we're able to create these really, uh, detailed kind of templates of what we do to make sure that the quality is the same from client to client and we can suck out all the data and we load it into a data warehouse and have kind of built our own analytics system to to kind of do some like retroactive analysis work on things i definitely want to get back to that that just sounds amazingly sexy on the <laughs> on the front end of it is um, data sexy sure <laughs> data yeah that could be a great t-shirt actually <laughs> make data yeah. sexy um, so one thing I, I want to get back to also though was you you keep mentioning this idea of culture and how that you know yeah. building this culture of people feeling like they can contribute you know in a meaningful way or in a creative way is really important. Um, sure. What are some of the ways that you guys have gone about building culture? You know, again in a remote context. Um, well, I think the first thing is who you hire, right? So you we have worked really hard. Let me say this: that I think that. 
if I look at the company as a whole, I, I work with the smartest people that I've ever worked with in my life. And I, you know, my background, I worked at Deloitte out of business school and I, I ran product marketing for a division of Seagate and I did a couple of early stage companies and we worked with investors. And But on the whole, like the people that, that I get to go to war with every day are really, really smart. And so that's kind of like an ante, right? In terms of like every time we hire somebody, we look back and we say, are they adding to the average kind of IQ of our company? And so the bar continues to get higher and higher every time we hire somebody. So that part being aside, you have to find people that have this DNA where they're they're competitive, but not to a fault. Um, they're helpful. Um, they, they are selfishly a team player, not sounding cliche, but... Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge basketball fan, right? So there's there's that role on a basketball team for the person who is so selfless that all they care about is the team wins, whether they play or not. And so if you look at that that model here, we have a lot of people here who um, they all play really critical roles in our company. But if you look at our Zoom channel on day to day basis, um, it's flooded with people that are saying so and so did an awesome job. And the whole thing lights up with people congratulating them. And that that energy is kind of contagious. And so I think if you hire people that are smart and that care about other people and that genuinely want to see them be successful and want to be part of a bigger team, that's 90 percent of the battle. The stuff that you kind of have to force is I don't get to see people every day. Right. So one of the things that I do is I, I look at the, I look at a list of people, you know, I haven't talked to so-and-so in a while. I'm going to call them and just see how they're doing. And it sounds really kind of forced. Like, how have you been? I haven't talked to you in a while, but it's the only way that we've really figured out to just say, you know what? Like I, I, I spoke to you. I have a ton of respect for you. I enjoy our friendship. And the only way, like, you know, if you have a friend that lives cross country to maintain a friendship is to actually invest in it. So you have to force that kind of stuff. And then on the, on a larger scale, uh, we do this event called Smart Boga Palooza, which um, if you're if you don't work near somebody, it's really easy to um, to kind of live through a screen and your significant other life partner or whatever your thing is. Um, they don't really know what that experience is either. And so we bring everybody to a five star resort resort on the West Coast because we want them to have some quality time with each other. We want their um, significant others to see what we're all about so that if they have a great day, they they know what it's about. And if they have a bad day, they're like, you know what? I met so-and-so at Smart Blog Palooza, and they're pretty cool. It's probably just a bad day. Um, and at the same time, right, people get to, like, just talk to each other and create this connection that carries them, like, throughout the year. And so I, I was talking to somebody who said that, oh, you just do remote because it's less expensive. And if for the people that try to do that, it's it's a fraud. It's a it's just not true because if you do remote right, it's more expensive, but you have better people. Wow, well said. Yeah. So on these in these meetups, so Smart Bugapalooza is what it's called. I love that. Yeah, you date um, myself, right? I can tell how old I am from the name. <laughs> well, at the event, how much of the uh, or at the meetup rather, how much of the time spent together is super tactical and work focused, and how much of it is just kind of open ended? Sure. So uh, I'll just kind of walk you through a really high level agenda. So people you will usually come in on a Sunday night. Um, we'll have a reception for them. Like last year, we had this really cool reception. We did it at um, we did the event at Montage in Deer Valley, which is just out, up the hill from Park City. Um, and so we did this reception with this great view of the mountain and stuff like that. And it's a great way for people to reconnect with people or people who work together, but they haven't seen each other. And there's this kind of weird, like, do I shake your hand? Do I fist bump you? Do I hug you? And then, <laughs> you know, like it, after five minutes or so, it's kind of warmed up and there's a, a lot of energy there. And then, uh, the next day we do an all day work session. So it's kind of an eight to five, uh, type thing, um, it's a mix of either guest speakers from partners or other thought leaders in the space. Uh, we do some team building things. We do some kind of, if there's an issue we need to solve, like we'll kind of work through that and make some larger announcements, um, things like that. And then that night, because that's kind of a long day, we have a pretty casual uh, dinner. And then the next day is free. So people can do what they want with people. And, um, you know, last year, some people played golf, some people went rock climbing, some people went mountain biking, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that they can do. And then we have kind of our big blowout event 
um, at the end. And last time we, we rented out a lodge and had a private um, chairlift that took them up to this view that they could hang out with. And then we came down and had kind of a country uh, kind of dinner with a band. And so, um, so most of that time is fun and it's designed to, to let people bond with each other. But at the same time, we want to make sure that people uh, have a chance to work together face to face for some brief period of time. And we deliberately make sure that people are working with people they don't work with every time because that, you know, ultimately they were there to try to solve some problems and do some new things for the next year. And that kind of fuels it. Absolutely. It sounds like, you know, a massively impactful experience for the team, but also a lot to plan. So do you have somebody on your team who's dedicated to kind of managing logistics from flights and everything else to setting up these events or what does that look yeah. like in terms of the planning? Yeah. Side? So, um, so I am very lucky to have uh, my wife, who's my best friend. She's also our general counsel. She used to run um, legal for a large fashion company. Um, so she um, she loves planning this kind of stuff. So we kind of treat it like a wedding. And at this point, you know, we had 65, 75 people last time. Wow. So this year we'll probably have close to 100. So it, it is to the point now where it's kind of like a wedding weekend. And so she... She, you know, her goal is to make sure that people who otherwise have not, would have not taken that experience at this point in their life have an experience that they're going to be home, be able to take home, um, regardless of whether they work at Smart Bug of Palooza for a long period or not, that they're going to be able to take that memory and the friends that they made and meet and carry that with them because we feel like that that's important. In terms of the logistics and all that kind of stuff, we usually give people some um, some guidelines on flight times and things like that. And then everybody kind of books their own. So, cause they have to coordinate it with their significant other usually and, and all that kind of stuff, but we handle most of it. Definitely. So I want to change gears here for a second, cause I've heard you mention a few times now that your company is up to about 50 or 60, uh, team members, which is yes. amazing. Congratulations. Um, I yep. wanted to ask you a little bit about what scaling that team looks like. So maybe even just starting with, uh, when you make decisions to hire, you know, I know a common trend in agency world is to hire to fire. And it's one thing that we wanted to avoid from the beginning with ours is not just hiring people with a big account. So what are some of the things that go into the decision making process around hiring new team members? And then maybe sure. we can talk a little bit about onboarding. Yeah, I think um, the hire, I've never heard that phrase hire to fire, but it sounds kind of uh, not great. Um, we've never actually had to fire somebody because of accounts going away or something like that. But we, um, I grew up in the tech space. So, um, I try to run the company like a startup. And so, uh, we have a, we have an in-house HR team and an in-house recruiter. And, you know, we, know, we have, a, I think a very strong sales team. We haven't actually made an outbound prospecting call in the history of our company. So we eat our own dog food with marketing. I felt like the the biggest thing that you could do to scale was to make sure you have strong PR and marketing from the beginning because that makes life a lot easier uh, for everybody. And so um, we know that based on our hiring plan and our growth and kind of what those trends look like, how many people that we need to hire in a certain time. We also know that um, people don't always look for jobs on the schedule that we want them to. And so we're kind of constantly in a recruiting phase. And we'll often run into these situations where um, we know that we're going to hire one person now and one person in six weeks. And we've got two really great people. And one of them, for whatever reason, maybe it's account fit or market fit or whatever, ends up being slightly a better fit at that particular time, even though they're both strong. And we'll just say, hey, look, you've already gone through the interpro process. If you can wait six weeks, you've got a job here. Um, you don't have to interview again. We've already done that stuff, but we're kind of staggering this stuff. And so... Um, we hire, uh, just enough ahead to have buffer. Um, but we don't, um, I think a lot of agencies make these big field of dreams bets where they go hire 10 people and they expect money to fall from the sky. And, and we don't do that. And we're really fortunate. I think because we've invested in our brand, we're, we're in some positions, we have a bit of a waiting list of people that we've already kind of qual waiting list is probably the wrong phrase, but people that we've already qualified that we've already interviewed and we know that they're really good. And, um, we're just kind of pacing ourselves, and they end up coming on board, um, usually in the next month or six weeks or so anyway. That's awesome. So one quick follow up to that. I know that you mentioned before when we were talking about how you build culture, you said it starts with the people that you hire. Mm -hmm. uh, and two things you mentioned were, you know, just a high level of intelligence, just being a smart person who can figure things out. And the other was being able to celebrate maybe the success of others. What, I guess, how do you try to measure for some of those things in the interview process? 
uh, and sure. maybe what else do you look for in a candidate? Yeah. So, um, in the interview process, we're looking for, well, so we don't, we don't have, we don't have an internship program. We don't hire a lot of fresh outs. Um, some agencies have kind of built their model on that stuff, but we always felt like, you know, as a client, when I used to hire agencies, the worst possible thing was when an agency would come in and they'd have this whiz bang process. And then as soon as the partner left, the people that were doing the work weren't marketing strategists. They were from different functions and super nice people, but they didn't really have any business kind of doing the strategy that we hired them to do. So um, when we were doing some market viability, when we started, the people that we talked to were just like, if you could put together a, an agency that's kind of by marketing for marketing and people have the same scars on their back that I do, then that's far better. So when we look to hire, um, we have a unique situation where we don't really have to teach them marketing because we don't hire fresh out people. Um, we rely on somebody who's got some experience with the platforms that we use because um, we don't really feel like we need to train people on that, at least not on how to use it, but in the way that we use it, which is a lot different. And so when we go to hire, um, we're looking for people who've walked in the shoes of our clients. They have this experience where they've launched a product, they've managed a P&L, they've walked into a board meeting and explained what happened with a chunk of money that did or did not go well, because those life experiences make a difference as a marketer, right? You, especially if you've had a bad campaign and you had to go justify what happened to that, like you don't want to do that again. And so I think one of the issues with a lot of agencies is, um, and kind of agency lifers is that it, for them, the success is all about the creative, like the creative is out and isn't it beautiful and look at it, but the creative doesn't really mean anything. It's what the creative does and does it generate profitable revenue? And so we look for people that have, have had that experience. Uh, we look for people that have had, uh, integrated marketing channels. So, um, this idea that if you work at a digital agency that you should only know digital is sort of silly, like because digital is a channel and there's clients that need more than one channel. And so you should have some, you know, experience and familiarity with that stuff. We look for people that have competed in some way. Uh, it doesn't mean that you had to compete in sports, but um, at the end of the day, you want people that know whether they won or lost at the end of the day, because um, those are the people that are motivated to not lose two days in a row. Um, and then finally, you look for people that have some purpose outside of work because for two reasons. One is um, I think it makes people interesting and it brings unique backgrounds to people. And um, the second thing is that I think from a remote perspective, if somebody's life is you know, completely fueled by what happens with coworkers, uh, they're not going to really work out in a remote space. Like you need somebody that's got, you know, fuel from something else in their life and work is part of it, but it's not the only defining piece. Absolutely. So, you know, say that you find somebody who kind of meets that criteria, you feel comfortable, your HR team is bringing them in. What does maybe the first 30 days or so look like for, uh, for them coming on board? Sure. So, um, one other thing I'll add to the interview process is, um, people are asked to demonstrate their expertise in some way. So we have them either, uh, prepare a campaign for us, um, based on a fictitious situation or walk us through the details of one or give us a pitch or something, because, um, I think it differentiates people from who can interview well from people who can think well. Um, the first 30 days though, we have spent a whole bunch of time and money on, um, creating what we think is a unique training program. So a lot of agencies that I've spoken to, their training program is like, all right, new person. So your job for the next 30 days is to watch these 500 training videos. And then at the end of these 500 videos, we're going to ask you to recall everything that you've learned and be this fully embedded marketer. Um, that doesn't really work well. And it's ironic that that happens in, in the agency space because it doesn't happen anywhere else in any profession in the world. So we said, okay, what was likely the most successful uh, kind of training model that we found. And we found that the apprentice model from basically the entire industrial revolution and anything that gets built in some way was the best. And the reason why is because like, if, if I am, you know, say I'm a, a, a Mason, the first thing that I learn how to do is to mix cement and cements the foundation of everything. And as an apprentice, I'm going to learn how to mix cement really, really well. And I'm going to do it for a few weeks to make sure that I've got that skill down. And then at some point, the person that I'm apprenticing with is gonna say, you know what, 
you've got that part done. I trust you to go do that. Now let's talk about the next skill that you have. And so we've kind of followed that same thing with this idea that you should be 80% effective in 30 days. And the way that we do that is we say, okay, what in your role is the task that you do the most frequently? And we're going to train you on that. Um, we're going to let you practice it across clients until you get really good at it. And then we're going to turn you loose to do that for your client. And then we're going to work on the second most popular skill that you have for your role. And we're going to continue to kind of do this over time. So after you do that for three or four kind of areas that you become proficient in, um, now you're 80 percent effective in a short period of time. And the things that you do most, you can do really, really well. And the things that you need help with still, now we can focus very narrowly on those and spend like serious quality time on that extra 20 percent, which is the difference between somebody who executes well and somebody who strategizes and executes well. And that's worked out really, really well for us, um, not only from a time to market perspective, um, but also the feedback that we get from people that come to work here is that they just haven't been to a place that provides like the depth of training that we do. And so it ends up creating a really great experience for the employee and also for our client. That's brilliant. I love that. It sounds also like in that model, there's a lot of cooperation that happens amongst the different team members that are kind of bringing that person along with them. So it's just, just a general openness amongst the team that this is expected of them to kind of bring somebody along and teach, or are there just a few people on your team that kind of take that role? Well, the way that we've staffed our, um, our, we have strategists who are kind of uh, the, the CEO of an account and we don't use account managers. In, in my opinion, account managers job is, you know, solely to run interference between the smart people you hired and the client. And so we figured, you know what, why not take a little bit of a margin haircut and have a strategist report directly to a client and own five or six accounts. Um, and so rather than eight or nine accounts. And so that way, from a client perspective, they've got this, you know, director of digital that works for them and there's no interference between the two. Um, and then so that that strategist job is to make sure that the consultant that they have um, gets caught up to speed and then they look outside of their team uh, in order to give them some additional practice on some things because everybody can use some help uh, here or there. The training program gets built by the the team leaders and the executives that run the line of business that they have, and they work with uh, the strategist or strategist equivalent on those teams to put together the depth of the curriculum. So everybody gets a chance to kind of create some of the curriculum for our team uh, because we found that by by having people do that, by having people be teachers in some role, it, it also makes them better at what they do. Um, and it allows us to have different styles that are contributing to this person's uh, development. It's awesome. It's a virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to professional development, when it comes to kind of keeping your, your team up to date, tell me a little bit about uh, something I picked up on that you guys do really well, which is which you've called certification days. Maybe you can walk us through what a certification <laughs> day looks like. Yeah. Um, so the, I mean, you've heard the analogy of the car, the, the cobbler has no shoes and all that kind of stuff. So, sure. um, so it's an interesting dynamic in a lot of agency environments. Um, not a lot of actual continuous training happens, right? Like you're sort of on your own. And at the same time, we realize that probably the ROI of a solid training program and the ROI of uh, an employee who grows their skill set over time is such a no-brainer and people spend, I think, too much time talking about it. So if I asked you this hypothetical question, do you think if you spent eight hours learning something new that you would be able to somehow recoup that eight hours in terms of billable time with a client over the next year? You'd, you'd probably be like, yeah, that's okay, great. So, so that's what we do with certification day. So the only way to really give people the headspace to be able to learn is to take everything else out of their heads. So we shut down the company for four days a year, one, one a quarter. We do what's called certification day. So last quarter, we dedicated 480 man hours to training on a Friday in December. And it's really cool because um, we have a spreadsheet and people kind of map out what they're going to take. And they've kind of like thrown the gauntlet down. They're like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And if you have this spreadsheet up over the day, you start to see like pass, 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 like popping up on these on this kind of leaderboard. And um, it's really fun. People usually record some videos to kind of like declare to the world what they're going to learn that day. Um, HubSpot's been uh, been great. They have such a great curriculum and we do a lot of HubSpot work. So that's there. And so they've kind of jumped on board with certification day with us to help promote it so we can get some other 
agencies and clients to do it. But it's just a great way. People get super excited. They, you know, shut off the world and um, and they just get to learn and learn something new. And they're then they're on Zoom. And if they have questions about certain things, it's great. When they pass things, they they brag about it and everybody's fired up for them. And it's just a, an awesome way to uh, to get people's brain working. That's awesome. What is the client response been to uh, to learning about certification days? They dig it because they get more value. Because the question on, on Monday when they come back is like, well, what did you learn on certification day? Well, I learned how to do these five new things better. Let's talk about it. All right, cool. Let's talk about it and let's see how this fits my business. And so everybody wins. A client gets somebody who's got more skills and has you know this kind of continuous refresh of knowledge. The employee gets to make sure that they're growing their skills and they have more pride in what they're doing. They're excited to do something new. And so it just kind of perpetuates itself from quarter to quarter. That's awesome. Yeah, suddenly you have clients asking you to uh, to take more certification days per quarter. <laughs> yeah, not yet, but I wouldn't be su- I wouldn't be surprised. That's awesome. So um, that's fantastic. So when it comes to I guess just kind of zooming out here for a second, Ryan, when it comes to running this operation remote, you've seen it from a few you know employees up to now fifty or sixty. I guess what's the biggest advantage if you had to distill it down into one? Like what's the biggest advantage that you see operating your company this way? And then maybe on the flip side, what's the what's the greatest challenge? Sure. So um, the biggest advantage, um, like I said, when I gave this talk at Inbound in Boston this year, I gave this talk. And um, one of the points that I made, like I mentioned before, was that uh, people always say, oh, well, remote, like, that's great. Like, you're not paying rent. And OK, whatever. That's not that much in the whole scheme of things. The biggest advantage we have is talent. Like, I can get extremely talented people really fast um, that want to be part of a team that does performs really well and that allows us to scale so most agencies um, especially either ones that are have a full office in my opinion or the ones there's some hybrids where they're like well we have a full office and we have these satellite people and and that doesn't really work because all the satellite people are alienated in some way because they miss all the water cooler talk but the people that at least I'm from Orange County, right? So if I wanted to have a, an office in Orange County, I'm basically battling the same talent for anybody who's willing to drive an hour to go 10 miles. So ultimately, I have to either not grow or I have to hire people that aren't as good as I want to hire because that's all that's left. If I'm a remote company, I don't have to do that. I hire the best person, period, and I've got a lot to choose from. And so it allows me to get talent faster. The um, uh. The disconnect or the, I guess the biggest challenge really is, and I don't know that it's like, I guess probably the biggest downside is what I mentioned earlier, which is there is, there is something to be said for being able to, uh, you know, walk through the office and see that so-and-so is kind of melancholy today. And so to be able to like sense that and take them out to lunch and, you know, high five them and find out what's going on and see if as a human, you can be helpful to somebody who's having a bad day. You don't get visibility to that all the time. Um, the other, uh, and, and you can force it, but you still can't replace it. But I think, um, the trade-offs for our model are, are so far ahead of that, that downside. I think, um, and the other thing is just like it's harder to be, uh, you know, like as we get bigger, right? It's I have to real, I have to work really hard to stay connected with people because you don't have those like one-off kind of, you know, kitchen conversations and and stuff like that where you jump into a lunch with somebody. So those two things are probably the hardest. But from like a, a like a mechanics of scaling and all that stuff, if you build the company right, that part's actually really easy. And the, it's so it's not really a challenge. It's this really cool puzzle to see like how big can you build a remote company where the the cultural intimacy isn't gone. And we're going to keep doing that until that happens. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems just kind of uh, thinking back on the types of people that you need to hire to do your job. Well, like it's not transactional types of work. Like it's, you're looking for strategists with kind of a rich background. So removing that constraint uh-huh. seems like it'd be a huge advantage. Absolutely. Yep. Cool. Yeah. I guess one thought about, um, you know, you're in a unique situation where you're on the early side of creating a remote company. So I think you uh-huh. have a lot of history and kind of background to look forward. Sure. What's one way that you think remote might change, if at all, you know, in the next five to 10 years? Sure. So um, so it's sexy now, whether it stays sexy or not. I don't know. I remember uh, probably five years ago, I don't know if you remember, everybody was talking about open office spaces. 
and how everything and it's awesome right because i went to see a friend of mine um who they just redid their whole office and you walk in and there's like these mork and mindy eggs all over the place and all these bright colors and no cue walls and all this kind of stuff and i remember i went to visit him had lunch that was a Friday, came back, got my mail on Saturday. There was an ink magazine, opened ink magazine, turned to a thing. And the, the cover like story of like the office area was basically open offices are dead. So <laughs> I kind of just laughed in the sense that um, it was so trendy then. And I, I think that I think remote will be different because at the end of the day, like um, if you hire really smart people and give them the flexibility to live their life and create life memories, um, they're going to want to stay with you for a long time and they're going to ultimately bond with with people that have similar things. So, you know, I kind of look at, at remote as being one of those things that's going to going to stick around for a long time. I think what will happen, though, is that everybody's going to want to do it. The people who've learned how to do it well and create a great experience. Uh, I, that's where I think working with people that are, um, you know, you have this deep intellectual respect for matters. Um, those are going to be the people that are in, ending up getting the best talent. And the ones that don't have that experience are going to get the ones who want to work remote because maybe they just don't want to drive to work. And so um, so we feel like we got a little bit of a head start from people, but we feel like that even if we didn't, our model and the way that we hire people will will help us through that transition. And so we're kind of excited to see what happens there. Awesome. I want to be respectful of your time. I know we're kind of coming up to the top of the sure. hour. Um, I guess maybe one last question or two, if you're if you're cool with yeah, that. Yeah, I've got as much time as you need. You got, okay, awesome. Uh, yeah. So kind of thinking back, you know, over the course of 10 years or so of, of SmartBug, what's maybe one thing that you would do differently or just even sooner if it's if it's not something that you do differently? Yeah, I would actually, the thing that I would have done first probably is I would have hired a PR person um, earlier. We did that. We did PR early, but... Um, I think as an agency, right, you, uh, well, that and, and hire like a strong client services leader, because that would have given me the space to kind of do some things earlier than I wanted to. But I think every agency goes through that, right? The founders found it. They're the ones who do the selling. They get to the point where they can't do the selling and the work. So then they have a decision to make. Do they hire a salesperson or do they hire a client services person or how do they do that? The problem for some agencies are that if you can't sell, you've got a problem. So um, so one of the benefits of, of really focusing on marketing and PR early is that you work, you don't work as hard for sales. So the, the stronger you can make your brand earlier, the larger you can appear to the market sooner. Um, those are all the proof points that you can create from client work and, and publish those earlier. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, um, I was interviewed the other day and I mentioned something along the lines of if I'm going to work at a company, I'm going to do some homework. And if I see that that person's nowhere on the internet, then that's a red flag to me. If I see that that company's all over the internet and they're on podcasts and guest posts and all this stuff, then as an employee, that's like a big risk mitigation thing to say, I want to go spend the next part of my life that I can't get back with this company and I think it's the same with clients, right? To the extent that a client's going to do the same due diligence. And if they see that you're all over the place and it's clear that you're like, you know, kind of moving the needle in terms of thinking about marketing and executing and there's some proof points, they're going to look at you from a risk mitigation perspective and say, you know what, the, it's a safer decision to work with you than it is to work with somebody else. And so I think what a lot of agencies do is they focus so much on the revenue side, which you have to. Um, but they don't spend a lot of time on their own marketing. And so they're, they have to work so hard to attract clients and, and so hard to convert deals when if they just did some marketing and some PR first, the deals that they did get, they would, they would close a lot more and they would get more deals, you know, net anyway. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. I feel like, um, there's a lot of people that are gonna be listening to this that are in services, but there's also people that are maybe in tech and products. And I think that advice goes far for, you know, regardless of the industry that you're in. Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to, I guess, your role, so as founder, as CEO, how has that changed, you know, specifically with respect to running a remote company, but um, in general, how has your role changed and evolved as your team grows? Like what does, you know, an average day look like for you right now? Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, um, somebody made this comment. I have a, I have a, a really dear friend who 
was with Saatchi for a while and he's kind of like a, a buddy advisor, you know, sounding board uh, type guy. And, and he said, you know, Ryan, all roads run through you. And if you ever want to grow, they can't. So, um, what we did was he said, okay, well, I need to, cre- I need to create this really strong management team. So over the last two years, I think we have um, put together a very strong team. Uh, we've got a client services leader, uh, sales, le- sales and marketing leader, development and creative. And, and those four people are, um, have a lot of scars on their back, have, are really smart people and have, have done stuff in their prior lives before they got here. And so, that's enabled me to kind of, whereas they can focus on what's going to happen in 2019, for example, um, I can focus on um, what needs to happen in 2020 and beyond. And since my background is launching products and and product marketing and stuff like that, that's fun for me because I get to look at what the market's going to look like and figure out where we need to place some bets, both in terms of either services or products and some partnerships. And so um, that's enabled me to step back and, and do some of that stuff. And then we, um, we recently hired a talent director because people are the most important thing. And, um, if with the rate that we're, we're growing, we really kind of wanted to say, okay, if you're going to run a company like a startup, you need to kind of think about human capital as a startup as well. And so, um, she's a really sharp, a sharp lady who's starting to put together some really interesting programs. And so, now I really just kind of get to step back and, and figure out what we're going to do in 2020 because we've got our 2019 plans locked in and they're they're off and rolling. So um, that makes it, I think, a lot more strategy and a lot less kind of client management and tactical execution and and stuff like that. Awesome. That's great. Ryan, thank you so much for your time. Sure. Uh, I guess as we wrap up here, where can people find you? Where can they reach out if that's something that you even Yeah. Want? <laughs> no, I, I like I like new friends. And if people have questions, I'd love to hear from. My email is just ryan at smartbugmedia.com. Um, our website is smartbugmedia.com. And I love to chat with people on LinkedIn. So um, hopefully I can meet up with you guys there. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm glad that we have the same uh, cabinets. And I uh, <laughs> hope you have a great day. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Right, take care.